Yeah, I, I think that um, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that I think the respect that you have for Alex is mutual, um, as it is among many of us um, in this group today. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, I think that we'll be able to share a little bit more information about the rest of the series as well. Um, so that information will be, will be coming out, but I know that you have um, an active Twitter feed um, and folks can follow you there or on um, Facebook, is that correct? Where, where are the best places to find you on social media? Uh, Twitter is great. Uh, if anybody wants to read about the series, go to the Equity Literacy Institute website and there's a link, I think it's to book series at the very top and you can uh, read about the series and you'll just see how perfectly Alex's book fits into the series. It's like, it's like exactly the kind of book we were uh, looking for, for the, uh, for the series. Wonderful, wonderful. And we'll try to get those links in the chat um, today so that um, folks have access to them. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to um, now go ahead and introduce our guest of honor. Um, Alex Chevron Venet is an, educa an educator author and professional development facilitator based in Vermont. She began her career teaching English at an alternative therapeutic school where she later served as a school leader. Currently, Alex teaches courses in the humanities and education at the Community College of Vermont, uh, Antioch University, New England and Castleton University. She facilitates equity-centered trauma-informed workshops for educators at all levels, including presenting nationally at conferences and as an independent consultant for schools and districts. Alex co-organizes EdCamp Vermont and the Trauma-Informed Educators Network Conference. Alex's writing has appeared in Edutopia, MindShift, and the School Library Journal. This is her first book, and you can learn more about her and follow her work at unconditionallearning.org. So Alex, welcome. Um, Thank I, you. <laughs> I, I have to say, you know, I'm reading your bio and I've known you for a really long time. And, um, and as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, wow, wow, I don't know if I knew all this. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the most important thing about that whole bio is the part that isn't in it, which is um, I consider you to be a a trusted colleague and friend, and um, I'm just so honored to be able to be here with you tonight. So um, I would love if you could spend just a little bit of time right now talking about, um, you know, I think that you have um, sort of a, an overview that you can share with us that just sort of gets us started. I mean, you can, I think I've held this up several times, but if you ask me to do it, I would just end up reading the whole book to people and we don't have to do that tonight. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a, a few minutes of just overview and then we'll get into some question and answer stuff. Yes, so I'm gonna take us through the whole Alex Vanette experience because that's, that's what I have to do uh, whenever I get my chance on Zoom. So uh, you have my introduction uh, for those of you who, uh, who don't know me, I'm glad to meet you and happy to see some friends and familiar faces here. Um, I'm coming to you from Winooski, Vermont, where it was, I saw something, it was the hottest place in the US today. So that was not great, but, uh, but um, glad to be here together. Um, before we start, we have to get ready to learn. So this is, you know, we, we have to do our things to get ourselves grounded and ready to learn. So just really briefly, I'm gonna turn off my camera for about, 15 seconds and I invite you to do the same and just take a minute, check in with yourself. There's some options on the screen that you might use, but just take a moment to kind of be here now. So just 15 seconds. Okay, we'll come back together. The other thing we need to do before we dive into a learning experience is to check in with the others that we're learning with. So I always have to do Rose and Thorn whenever I start a learning experience. It's my favorite check-in. It's just a simple little uh, something going well for you today, something not going so well for you today. You can just talk about the weather or you can choose to be more vulnerable than that. And so I'd invite you to, if you'd like to just drop that into the chat, 
Um, I'll share that my rose is uh, this event and that there's only five more days till the official release day of the book. It's really exciting. And my thorn is the heat that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I wasn't ready for it at this point in May. So go ahead and you can share that in the chat. Um, because we're recording, sometimes when we do Rose and Thorn on Zoom, I'll read out some of the things that people enter in. Because we're recording, I'm not going to read them out um, so that your check-in will stay with those who are also here in the room. But I'd invite you, uh, if you're here, to, to take a look at the chat to just notice what others are bringing with them. It's just a really nice opportunity to, uh, to just see what other folks are bringing with them. And I also love to do this uh, check-in with students. And so you are very welcome to uh, steal it, borrow it, adapt it, take it with you. All right, while folks are doing that, I also just wanna encourage you all to take what you need. We are gonna be talking about trauma. Um, we're not gonna be going into too many really specific graphic type of examples, but I will be naming some different things that can potentially cause trauma. Um, and it can just stir things up. So I invite people to just notice if you feel like you need any support, reach out to those in your network. Um, and uh, you know, this is being recorded. You can come back to it later if you find you need to take a break or anything. All right, thank you to those who are sharing your rose and thorn in the chat. I appreciate you and getting to see a little snapshot of what folks are bringing with them today. So with that, uh, like Laura said, I'm just gonna go through basically uh, a big picture of uh, what this book is about and why I think it's so important that we have critical conversations about trauma-informed education and equity. So to start with, many of you may have heard of trauma-informed education. I know some of you are really familiar with it. Others of you, this may be you know, maybe you're just uh, getting familiar with it. You've heard about it. It's talked about in the news sometimes, trauma-informed care. Uh, it's very popular in a lot of districts. It, it, it has almost taken on this kind of buzzword quality, right? Like Paul said, the shiny new thing. Um, and, and one thing that I've recognized as I've really immersed myself in understanding trauma-informed education is that we're not always really talking about the same thing when we talk about trauma and when we talk about what it means to be trauma informed. So let's unpack this a little bit. One of the things that I think is important is the framing of how we understand uh, where trauma happens and what schools have to do with it. And that framing really matters in then uh, how we show up for students. And so let, let's give an example of one of these types of framing um, that's an example of something that I kind of unpack in the book. So a lot of times when you hear people talk about trauma-informed education, you're going to hear this phrase over and over again, bringing trauma to school with them. It's a phrase that you'll hear people talk about in the context of, um, oh, we need trauma-informed education because our students are bringing trauma to school with them. They're bringing trauma to school with them, and that makes it hard to be successful at school. Um, you'll kind of hear this phrase uh, quite frequently. And so I think that there is a challenge with this phrase. Uh, and I wanna offer that we should get rid of this phrase because if you say we bring trauma to school with us, that's true, right? People experience trauma um, in the community, at home, all kinds of places. And you know, the intent behind the phrase is, oh, you can't just leave things at the door, right? And so we have to be mindful of how trauma shows up in school. But when we say bring trauma to school, sometimes we're sort of gliding around the fact that trauma is already in school in a lot of ways because trauma can happen inside of schools. And this is really hard for educators to talk about, I think, because we all got into education because we wanna help, because we wanna teach, we want to support students. And so, of course, we don't want to say that schools are anything other than a loving, happy, safe place. But unfortunately, the reality is that trauma does happen inside of schools. And so kids who are not bringing trauma to school uh, might bring trauma home from school. Uh, there's many ways. Uh, just a few of them include things like harassment, bullying, 
um, things like transphobia and homophobia and anti-Semitism and all the different types of discrimination that show up between students from teachers to students. Uh, they show up in the curriculum, um, right? Like schools are not immune to those things being present. Um, there's aspects of school that are uniquely part of school that students will not find anywhere else that can be traumatic. For example, uh, seclusion and restraint as part of school discipline, uh, which can cause trauma to students, especially uh, students of color and students identified for special education services. We know that there's school violence, like school shootings. Um, and then there are some areas that might seem more subtle, but can be extremely stressful to children, like uh, high stakes standardized testing, um, the, the ongoing persistent stress, right, that can manifest as trauma in some students, uh, labeling and pathologizing and sort of the messages kids get about themselves can become trauma. And so to me, you know, a lot of trauma-informed education will talk about trauma that happens at home, talk about trauma that happens in the community, um, but it doesn't always take up this stuff that happens inside of school. So that's one of the, that's one of those frames that we need to bring into the work. And then with that understanding, okay, trauma is happening outside of school, inside of school, then you might say, okay, well, great. Then we have trauma-informed education. That's awesome. It's here to help, right? Not so fast, right? And, and so again, let's unpack this shiny new thing. Sometimes trauma-informed education can have too narrow a focus. Uh, a lot of texts that you'll see on trauma-informed education will really heavily focus on three things. Um, behavior and how trauma impacts behavior and how we need to shift behavior um, response in schools. We'll focus on the neuroscience of trauma and trauma and the brain. And it will talk a ton about relationships and how we need to build safe relationships at school. And let me say, these things are all really essential, right? I'm not in any way saying these aren't important. But what I wanna offer is that these aren't the only things, right? Uh, Trauma-informed education can be bigger than this. And I want to read you uh, a quote from an article by uh, Dr. Simona Golden and Dr. Debbie Kasnabis, who, who I think just say this really well. They say, trauma-informed practice is a powerful but incomplete tool. Powerful because it helps teachers understand the children in their classrooms and bring individualized care and attention to build resilience incomplete in dangerous ways because it is rarely paired with attention to naming and addressing systemic injustice and racism. So what they are saying, right, is that when we have those, the focus on meeting the kids who have experienced trauma, meeting them in the classroom with care, adjusting academics, um, you know, building relationships, that's all really important. But that's incomplete if it's where we stop, right? Um, if we say, uh, you know, trauma happens and there's not much we can do about the fact that trauma happens, but we can be responsive to it, I don't think that's enough, right? I think that schools are a site of great social influence and teachers um, are part of that. And so we actually have a lot more to do than simply be responsive. Um, we can be transformative. And so one way that we can start building this more expansive understanding is when we start to understand that, that, that trauma um, is not just a narrow definition that we may have heard if you're familiar with, for example, the definition of PTSD, or if you know about trauma in the brain. The more I look into trauma, the more I understand that there's a million fields of study that teach us about trauma and people's experiences. So there's sociology, history, uh, there's feminist studies and disability critical race studies. There's indigenous studies and epigenetics, which look at how trauma is passed down through generations. Um, there's, there's just all these different fields. And so if we stay really narrowly focused on, you know, trauma and the brain or trauma and children's behavior, we might be missing about um, uh, missing some of these bigger pieces of context, and you know a lot of the ways that uh, that all of these impact not just our students, but impact the way that school functions, and impact the adults, and impact the communities we're in. 
So when we take this more expansive view, when we start to broaden our lenses, then our role shifts in a really exciting way. We go from simply being responsive to the trauma that is brought to school, and instead we shift to um, the idea of a lens, not a label. So if we're looking at trauma-informed education just as something that we say, certain kids um, need trauma-informed education because they've experienced trauma and so we'll give that to them, um, that's a label, right? But, but instead we go to a lens. And I have this picture of a tomato because in the book I talk about my brother, my little brother who has worked in organic farming for several years. And uh, he helped me understand that uh, the, the term organic, right? A lot of us think of organic and we think of the tomato at the grocery store and it has the label next to it that says organic. And we say, okay, this tomato is organic. Uh, maybe it's healthier, I don't know, but that's gonna influence my view of this one tomato. But I didn't realize that to be organic, uh, it's not about whether that particular tomato uh, was grown with pesticides, right? I think that's what a lot of people know, is it grown with pesticides or not? But actually an organic farm has to have completely different soil practices. Uh, like the soil has to be treated in different ways. There needs to be different things for sustainability around the farm to encourage wildlife and biodiversity. Um, there needs to be different things about, you know, crop rotation and maintaining, you know, time for the soil to rest. And I, I really couldn't explain to you a lot about organic farming, except the idea that it's systemic and there is a lot more to it than just looking at the single tomato. And so I, I liken this to, uh, you know, a single student's experience of school um, could be trauma informed based on that single student's relationships and how that student's trauma is is met and responded to, but that's not the whole thing. We need a trauma-informed lens to fundamentally transform everything about education, right? The soil, the biodiversity, the sustainability, all of it needs to be transformed. And so when we do that, we uh, come to this uh, new role, which is that educators and schools are responsible not only for addressing the impact of trauma that's already happened, but preventing trauma inside our schools and disrupting the causes of future trauma, right? So not just addressing that trauma that kids might be bringing to school, but preventing trauma through, through making sure that our schools are not causing trauma. And then on a bigger level, disrupting some of the social systems and, uh, and, and the isms and the, and the biases, uh, the inequalities that can all go on to cause trauma in society and to build our students up as people who disrupt trauma and fight for justice. And so that really becomes a much more expansive view of what trauma-informed education is all about. Um, I think I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, hold on here because I know we're gonna talk together. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is just give a little overview of this framework that I talk about in the book and then Laura and I are gonna talk and unpack some of this a little more. So given that role of, of pulling together, we are addressing trauma that's already happened, we're preventing trauma from happening inside of schools and we're disrupting trauma, I kind of pose a new vision for, for um, principles that will ground trauma-informed education in equity, um, because I really see equity work and trauma work as the same thing. You know, a lot of schools will have their equity team and their trauma team, their equity professional development and their trauma professional development, um, separate initiatives, separate PLCs. Um, and really, uh, I think that they go so hand in hand because the things that cause inequity can also cause trauma. Um, inequity itself can be stressful and traumatizing to children in schools. Um, and when we address the conditions that are inequitable, we are also addressing the conditions that are causing trauma um, and creating schools that are equitable for students who've experienced trauma and also that, uh, 
and also that prevent trauma from happening because of inequity. And so the principles that I propose for equity-centered trauma-informed education are these, that trauma that equity-centered trauma-informed education is anti-racist and anti-oppression because racism and oppression cause trauma and they cause inequity. And so we need to be working against those at the core. That equity-centered trauma-informed education is asset-based. So we are always working from the understanding that our students are inherently worthy and have strengths and capacities uh, to heal and to learn. Um, and so we are not working from a deficit mindset that there is something to be fixed about kids because kids are not broken. Um, but we are working instead from a place of strengths. Equity-centered trauma-informed education is systems-oriented. So that whole the organic farm, right? That we're changing systems so that the changes that we make last, so they're sustainable. Uh, that we are being universal and proactive. So we are not picking and choosing some kids to get the trauma-informed education, other kids don't. And we're also not waiting until after a crisis. We're, we're doing this all proactively. We're being human-centered. So dehumanization causes inequity and causes trauma. And trauma is dehumanizing. And so we are always going back to the human at the center of everything in education. And finally, that we're social justice focused. So really my pie in the sky goal of trauma-informed education is that we create a world with less trauma. Um, and that's really big picture, right? But, it, but it's something that we wanna strive for, right? Educators, we plan with the end in mind, we plan with the goal. And so if our goal, if we consider that our goal would be, I want to create a trauma-free world, what would you do today in education um, in order to achieve that? So um, in the book, uh, what you will find is um, lots more about those principles. Um, and then uh, organized, the book is really organized around four big shifts that, uh, that I see that schools would need to make to sort of move us closer to equity-centered trauma-informed education. And I tried to put as many action steps and ideas as possible in there. So you'll get some of my pie in the sky philosophy, big picture, um, but you'll also get a lot of examples, a lot of stories from my own experience, from my colleagues' experiences, from schools that I worked in or observed. Um, and, and you'll find a lot of places to get started. Because one of the messages that I really try to get across is that we can't do it all, um, right? Like we are not any of us individually going to make all these changes by ourselves. And it can feel like a lot to, to address this problem of trauma, which feels really big. Um, but we can get started and there is always somewhere to begin. And so I try to offer a ton of starting places throughout the book. So that's my quick spiel about, uh, about what's in the book. And um, now I'm excited to uh, talk with Laura a little bit. And as we talk, um, please feel free to uh, put questions in the chat, um, ask anything you want, and we will try to weave those into our conversation. Thanks. So I'm actually going to start with a question that builds off your last slide or your second to last slide, because um, you, know, you talked about um, we, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And in your book on page 18, <laughs> um, you, you write, um, there is value in all of our work anywhere in the system. At the same time, it can be pretty darn frustrating to feel like we're doing all of that work and not seeing any of the larger issues go away year after year. There comes a point in almost every workshop or graduate course that I facilitate when a teacher raises her hand and says, quote, you keep talking about this system-wide stuff, but what am I supposed to do in the means to, meantime? I can't change our district policy or the state requirements, unquote. I love that question. <laughs> so how do you answer that question? Yes, yeah, so, so I talk about in the book, my answer to that question is I do a little, some hand motion situation with it, which is that I say, yes, on one hand you have um, all the things that you know need to change and all of these shifts that you see that need to happen. And then on the other, you have um, these big structures and systems that feel really impossible to move. And you just look at them and go, 
oh, I, I just know that if, if this thing could change on the state level or on the federal level, that's what I need to happen. And so what I invite teachers to do is to notice that there's friction, right? So there's friction between what you see needs to happen and what you recognize is happening on that bigger systems level that's blocking you up. And what I say is, you know, notice that friction and let it fuel your work a little bit. Um, and what I'm hoping for really is that the more of us notice that friction and start to work against it, um, the more that collectively we're gonna make change. Um, and, and I sometimes joke, right? Like I'm trying to, you know, have us overthrow those inequitable systems. Uh, but really that's kind of the goal, right? That in, enough of us working collectively can make those kind of changes. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, it reminds me actually of some of the stuff that we talked about way back in the day, you know, however many, we're not gonna talk about how many years ago it was, but all those years ago when we were together at Antioch. Um, but it does make me think about this, um, you know, listening to you talk and reading the book, um, I, I, it would be really easy for someone to think that this is the only thing you've ever thought about, like that this has been the topic of your research and study for your entire adult life. And, and I know that this, that just as you mentioned it before that, you know, it's about systems and things influencing one another, that this book is the product of a lot of different interesting inputs. I, I think when we were prepping for today, I talked about it feeling like the center of a Venn diagram with a whole bunch of circles, almost mm -hmm. like a flower. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little about how you got to this and um, sort of what are the influences that brought you to these ideas? Because I think people would like to be able to sort of be inside your mind a little <laughs> bit. You know, they can read the book, but let's hear a little yes. bit about the stuff that isn't in the book. Yes. So, you know, I, I mentioned in the book a little bit that, well, a, a lot, I have a lot of stories in the book about the school that I used to work at, um, which is an alternative therapeutic school that was really doing trauma informed before that was a thing. Um, and that's where I started my teaching career. And so to me, in some ways, trauma informed was the way things were. It wasn't a shift. It was just how we were doing things. Um, and then uh, while I was at that school, I got really interested in education technology, which might surprise some of you who know me now that that is not a thing I talk about a lot anymore. Um, but when I initially went to graduate school to get my master's at Antioch, I enrolled in the uh, experienced educators grad program to get my MED and my concentration was in um, problem-based learning with a focus in technology. Um, and so that's where I started grad graduate school, which again might surprise you. But in one of my very first classes, it was a, you know, a required class about um, child development. And my instructor was very great, um, but as he was talking about these different you know, modes of child development, I just kept thinking about my students and going, this doesn't really feel like it matches my experience of children who've experienced significant trauma, especially early in childhood, the developmental trajectory just feels really different to me. And so actually the first time I ever wrote anything about trauma-informed education was in that class. I wrote up a little, um, a little thing about trauma for my classmates because I kept bringing it up in class and they said, oh, we're really interested in this. Can you tell us more about you know, what it looks like to support kids who've experienced trauma. So I wrote up a little thing. Um, and, and so I went into grad school sort of with this focus on tech or problem-based learning and where I really left was, you know, with those things, but also just a better understanding of uh, what was meaningful to me about the school where I was, the importance to me of centering the experiences of uh, students' trauma um, and then really also just, you know, uh, in Antioch fashion, for those of you who are connected to Antioch, just that, you know, that, that grounding in justice and in centering our humanity. Um, and that really has, has, you know, just grown and driven from there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I'm also curious, you know, when somebody finishes your book, 
if they, um, one of my favorite things to do when I finish a book is to go and look at either the bibliography or the work cited, or you know, <laughs> I, try, I try to follow the breadcrumbs a little bit. Yes. So if somebody were going to uh, spend some time with authors or specific books or organizations, um, who would you, where would you tell them to start? Who are the influences? That's such a hard question because um, book recommendations is my love language and I could really go on for quite a long time about it. Um, oh, that's so hard. Um, you know, really there's a lot of people that I that I cite in here that I would encourage people to to follow those breadcrumbs. And so I'm trying to think maybe of just one or two that, that I would encourage people to look at. Um, uh, one, one scholar that I really appreciate is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Dutro, who is in Colorado, and she focuses on um, trauma in the literacy classroom. And uh, she just has some really beautiful stuff in her work about um, the reciprocal relationship between students and teachers and about how we bring our own stories of of trauma and our own stories of hard times into our relationships with students. Um, and, and I found that really beautiful and influential as I was reading. Um, another book that was hugely influential while I was writing um, is Dr. Bettina Love's We Want to Do More Than Survive, um, which uh, when I read it, it felt like it pulled together so many threads for me of anti-racism racism and equity as well as uh, you know, trauma and healing, as well as social emotional learning and some of the aspects of that that can be problematic. Um, and you'll see her work cited uh, in there a lot. But I, can, you know, I could go on for a whole hour about all the people I cited, but um, those are just two that, that popped to the top of my mind. And that also gives me, um, that reminds me that I said I would put the link in about um, Paul's work too. Mm -hmm. So I just dropped that link in the chat. Um, so um, I, and what you just said actually ties in nicely to a comment that we had in the chat from Valerie saying that, um, you know, when we talk about trauma, that when you talked about, you know, the whole students bringing trauma to school um, with a big line through it, um, she writes, I'm also thinking about the trauma that is brought to school by teachers, administrators, staff who are dealing with the aftermath of their own trauma history. And that actually um, brought up for me Again, as I flip to my tab, I, I'm not joking. Every one of these little pieces of paper has something written on it. Um, when you talk about um, boundaries, and um, I mean, I know this is a little bit of a turn because um, I think Valerie's talking about unresolved um, adult trauma, which is definitely a thing. But it also makes me think about, um, I've lost the word. What is the word when I my trauma is a result of my spending time without having Vic good vicarious trauma vicarious trauma mm -hmm. that's the word and so there's um there's a paragraph in here where uh, you say often teachers are enthusiastic about the perceived permission to connect in deeper ways with students they see trauma informed practices of giving them the boundary or giving them the freedom to dive into discussions of the hardest parts of life together boundaries are a tricky business what is the right level of involvement how do we know when we're keeping students' social and emotional lives too distant? And how do we know when we've gotten too close? And I wonder if you could talk about that a little. I could talk a lot about boundaries. I love boundaries. <laughs> and, and in my experience, boundaries are one of the most under discussed aspects of trauma-informed education because people will mention that healthy boundaries are important, but we don't always unpack that. Um, because if, you know, I think part of social emotional learning and trauma-informed education being human-centered, right, is recognizing that it's okay to talk about our lives in school, right, and that we can't leave our emotions outside and all of that, um, but we still have a particular role in the lives of our students, and when that, get, when that gets really blurry, we can end up actually putting students at risk, we can end up um, making things feel really confusing for us and for students, as you mentioned, um, it can also lead us more quickly into vicarious trauma and burnout when we start to feel like I'm taking on all of my students' problems and, and I'm the one responsible for them. And so in the book, I talk a lot about boundaries and about ways to 
reflect on your own boundaries, uh, some guidelines. For example, I talk about don't be a trauma detective <laughs> um, and really that it is not our job as, as teachers to try to find out exactly every little thing that happened to students, but instead to understand what they need. And so um, a shift there of, you know, I, I'm not here to dig down and process every little thing with you, but within my role as your teacher, what can I do to support you? Yeah, there's a great example um, in the book, um, an email. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very respectful way. I find that um, as a teacher, it and you know I teach grownups now, but when I taught kids and high school students, um, I I found that there were a lot of times where maybe I was getting a little bit too much information. Like I don't need to know the details of everything about this child. It doesn't feel like it's my place to know. And then on the other hand, I would get something that was very vague. You know, mm -hmm. so and so is having a, a bad day. If you need help, call the office. Like, could you give me a little bit more? Like, I, there's nothing, there's no bridge there for me to connect with the kid there. So mm -hmm. that even says, you know, he appreciates when mm -hmm. you ask him about this or this, and these are ways to support. And it, it's just a really lovely example. I would I'd recommend everybody find it if you <laughs> um, need to write an email like that, because it, um, it, it walks that line really, really nicely. Um, so uh, we, I want to make time for the chat questions too, but the chat's been pretty quiet, so I'm going to just keep asking my questions. <laughs> um, you talk about the ACEs mm -hmm. um, assessment tool, um, and um, and I really love that you don't link to it and you don't share it. <laughs> um, and and I think that um, you know you, the a lot of people I think now share your position. You know, it was one of those. It was the only tool that we had, so we thought it was the tool to use, but we weren't really well informed, and now people are better informed. Hopefully, they're making better decisions. What would you say to a teacher? I'm going to throw a hypothetical at you. I'm totally, uh, these are not questions we've discussed in advance, so I'm sorry about that, but I was thinking about it as I was Ready. <laughs> Okay. Um, a teacher is in school, and the administrator announces that they're going to, they're going to, um, when they send out class lists, they're going to include the ACEs score of each kid next to the kid's name. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know that that happens, but I'm just saying it happens. It's, it's, or they it, announce, sends a, it sends a shudder down my spine. <laughs> I know. Um, or, you know, that they're going to start admin, administering the ACEs to every child who's sent to the office for a behavior intervention or whatever. Going back to your, to my first question about, I'm only one person, what can I do? I'm the teacher, I'm sitting in the room, I'm hearing this. What's my first step? Mm. Well, for those of you who are wondering about the context of this, the ACEs is the Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, uh, I guess now it's sort of a framework, um, but started as a part of a larger study and has become kind of this 10 question checklist that gives you a score um, that is supposed to then correlate to potential negative health outcomes later in life. Um, this is an area where a lot of advocates of trauma-informed education are pretty divided. And so um, I think one thing to know is that my perspective on it is definitely, um, I would say, not necessarily the dominant perspective on this, but I feel very strongly that the ACEs score and checklist really has no place in education. And if you want my whole reasoning why, it's chapter, I think, four in the, in the book, yeah. chapter three or chapter four. Um, and so I really go into it. And so, you know, one thing I would encourage teachers to do is, you know, to seek out some of that info. So right in the book, or I also have some resources on my website about some of the issues around the ACEs score in schools. Um, and really, you know, if you're having that gut feeling that, you know, this just doesn't feel right. This feels like it's going to slap another label on kids. This feels like it's too invasive. Um, I encourage people to start with questions, right? Uh, write down some of those questions that are coming up and bring them to the decision maker. You know, start with that um, mindset of, you know, I, I just have some questions about this choice um, and then really dig into it from there. Um, because hopefully folks will be open to that. Um, you know, if we come from a place of, I wanna do what's best for students and I, I have some critical questions about how this is going to meet that or not meet that need, um, I think that's a place to start. 
That's great. Thank you. Um, it is, you know, it's funny because um, I guess it's where I sit in the world that it surprises me to hear that that it's a point of conflict because I mm -hmm. guess because of where <laughs> I sit in the world, right? Um, we, we have sort of a perspective mm -hmm. <laughs> at Antioch. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> um, so there was one other question that I had. Um, I guess, well, you sort of talked about it a little bit, but this idea of um, of inequity in schools as a, um, I don't want to call it a hinge um, or a trigger, but maybe a, a worsening factor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, and I see Valerie's question in there too. Let's talk about Valerie's first. Um, about unresolved adult trauma in teachers yes. and administrators. Yes, thank you, Valerie. For people who are um, maybe watching the recording, Valerie asked in the chat about hearing discussion about unresolved adult trauma in teachers or administrators. Um, this is something that's really important. And, uh, you know, part of what I talk about in the book is that the adults need the same care and attention to relationships and support as students. And uh, for adults to be there for students, they need that community of care. And one thing that I did in the book was, um, you know, in a lot of texts that you read about trauma-informed education, there is a chapter about self-care and it has some things about mindfulness and it has some things about taking care of yourself and, and making sense of the work. And I think all that's really important. And I talk about that in the book, but the way that I did it was, I actually addressed that section of the book to leaders. Um, I said, leaders, I'm gonna talk to you right now because teachers um, need to care for themselves, yes, but they also need to be cared for. Um, they need to have opportunities to make meaning. They need to have opportunities to uh, get, their, um, get their physical, emotional, and mental health needs met. Um, and you as the leader, uh, have influence over things like access to insurance, flexible time off policies so they can go to the doctor, um, you know, helping to influence some of those policy level things. Um, and also as a leader, you have the ability to set the tone and address conflicts in school and to be accountable. And so, um, and so in that way, I think, you know, th those are the systems level things that I think will help those teachers uh, and different adults in school address some of that, uh, their own stuff. And for you know, further reading and, and looking at that issue, um, I would recommend uh, to, like I said, book recommendations are my love language, but for kind of unpacking more of that specific unresolved trauma in your own background, there's a book called, um, it's actually, I have it right here, um, Trauma Stewardship by Laura Vandernew Lipsky. Um, which is really great and goes through a lot of that um, type of thing. And then um, I would also encourage people to follow um, along the work of my friend Arlen Casimir, who is currently writing a book that will come out uh, sometime in the next year that really looks at that inner life of teachers in the context of, of trauma and healing. So Liza has a, a question in the chat as well that I'm just going to read because it's actually one that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, she says, uh, I'm often thinking of trauma as a huge and significant event, a family death, a car accident, abuse, et cetera. But the more I get into this work, the more I'm understanding trauma in a broader context. Can you share your definition of trauma or the way you think of it in general and thinking of COVID trauma and returning to school in the fall? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I actually, I just flipped to where I, I try to define it in the book. And I write in the book that um, I say, consider this a snapshot of a moving object and recognize that understandings of trauma continue to expand and evolve. So if you remember, I had that slide with all the different fields that contribute to trauma. Our understanding of trauma is evolving all the time. And in, in current conceptions of trauma, you're right that things like uh, uh, COVID and uh, the stress of school and all that has been encompassed in school can be experienced as trauma um, because we're understanding that persistent stress 
uh, and stressful conditions can be traumatic as well as those big one-time events. So you're totally right with that. Um, and my definition goes into that a little bit that uh, it, it's those of, it could be a response to those events, but it also can be a response to those sort of ongoing stressful conditions. Um, I think we might have time for one more question and then we'll do the wrap yeah. and the wrap up stuff. Yeah. So if there's another question, this is your moment. <laughs> One thing I don't like about Zoom's chat is that you don't get the dot, dot, dot when somebody's typing. Mm. Okay, so I see one from Kim, which is a big question for the last question of the night, which is if student has trauma caused by a teacher, how do you work to undo it? Um, I give an example in the book actually about a student who, um, who I worked with who had experienced a uh, a sort of really stressful, potentially traumatic experience from a teacher um, when he was younger and then really struggled to trust teachers and to trust school. Um, it, even though that experience wasn't at my school, it wasn't in my district, it wasn't with me, right? But, but kids can, I mean, any people, right? You map those experiences onto other folks in part because you're trying to keep yourself safe. And so it's totally makes sense that you would try to keep yourself safe by um, being, you know, having your walls up in similar situations. And so, uh, you know, it's gonna depend on different situations, of course, but I always just encourage teachers to really work from that place of understanding that uh, you're you, but you are also a representative of an institution. And right, like you didn't get into teaching because you wanted to be a representative of an institution, but you are in a lot of ways. And so to really just recognize that, to work really hard at building trust and to just be mindful that, um, that not everyone uh, trusts and feels great about teachers. And there's not necessarily something you personally can do to undo that. Um, but if you really work to create that school environment um, and system that is human centered that is uh, working towards, you know, the, the assets of all your students, you can maybe create the conditions where they can feel ready to, um, to try to build that connection. Thank you. Oh, Jesse wants to know if you um, have worked with the book, The Body Keeps the Score. I have read it and I have thoughts about it for another day. So let, let, <laughs> we'll connect another time. <laughs> great, great. Okay, so I think that we are um, ready to wrap up. Um, so first, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. This has been Alex Chevron Vanette. I think I mispronounced your name at the beginning, <laughs> okay. which is <laughs> I should, by this time I shouldn't do that. Um, and I believe we have a slide to show where you can get the book. Yes, let's do our little raffle first real quick, um, which I have on my screen. So people will have to be here to win. So if you're here, is Laura still here? Or is that gonna flip to Suzette? It was Suzette. Suzette, are you still here? Yes, okay, I see you. Um, <laughs> Suzette, can you, I know you have a way to message me. Can you message me your address, Suzette? And then one more person. Okay. Carrie, are you still here? Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Yay. Carrie, if you can um, just private chat me your address, then we will get that to you. Okay. And now I'll turn it over to Laura for the wrap up stuff. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. So um, again, thank you. Um, if you would um, like to, if you didn't win, which we're sorry that you didn't win, um, we do have um, information here about how you can buy a copy or two of Alex's book. They make great gifts, um, especially if you have like a new, um, new to the field teacher, or if you're a mentor next year, there's a great welcome to the district gift. Um, so. Shelly's fast forwarding to get us there. There we are. 
Um, this is where you can, um, and I think you can also buy Alex's book from any local bookstore. Um, you can order it through your local independent bookstore if you'd like. Um, there's also, I know Alex, you're doing a trauma-informed classroom jumpstart this summer. I don't know if you wanna talk about that at all. Yes, yeah, so I'm doing a six part webinar series this summer that you can take as um, the whole thing. You can take it as one or two and it's really designed to help people um, get, get ready for the fall with sort of trauma informed foundations. I'll also say I'm also co-facilitating a um, non-Zoom, non-screen time professional development opportunity um, called Nurturing the Nurturers Unplugged. Um, and I will drop that in the chat in a moment. If you cannot fathom logging into Zoom this summer, I got you. <laughs> and I'm also, uh, there are links to all of these things in the chat. Um, so you should be able, you'll see them, they're all in one big block. Um, let's see, if you enjoyed this event, um, you can learn about more continuing education uh, events at Antioch. Um, at antioch.edu slash continuing dash education. Um, we always have interesting things going on. Um, and if you'd like information about any of Antioch's degree programs, you can also uh, request information on our website. We do have a trauma-informed education um, certificate program that is a standalone certificate or can be added to a master's degree. So um, that is available as well. Um, there is an evaluation that has been emailed to you. And uh, if you um, fill out the evaluation, oh, I guess there's also an evaluation link in the chat, um, then you'll be able to get your certificate of attendance after you complete the evaluation. Um, the certificate I know is really important for some folks when it comes to um, your recertification. So if you need that for professional development credit, that's how you'll be able to access that. Um, we know that you do so much more work then you get certificates for, but, but this is at least something that we can give you that, that can be helpful. Um, so I think that's about all of our time. I'd like to thank Paul for joining us at the outset and Shelly for hosting um, today and helping us get organized. Um, and, um, and I guess that's all that we have. Alex, thank you for all your hard work. Thank um, you everyone. The ripples out from your work are gonna be greater than you can ever imagine. So thank you for letting us be a part of it tonight. Thanks so much for hosting me, Laura, and thank you everyone for coming. And I can't wait to hear what you think about the book. Oh, that reminds me, how do people find you on social media? What's oh, yes, um, I'm, I'm Alex S. Vanette on Twitter. I'm putting this in the chat. I'm unconditional learning on Instagram. And I have a little book hashtag, which is I'm reading Ecti. So if you uh, are a person who wants to share stuff, go ahead and share on social media. Awesome. Thank you so okay. much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And have, have a great night. Bye.